to all ups school of engineering welcome to the today's session i dr sudeer joshi head aerospace engineering department welcome all to the participant for this webinar launching kalpana chawla in the realm of astronaut maker by dr ravi margasem global space ambassador john f kennedy space center nasa i also welcome professor gurvinder singh vaid dean school of engineering for this session so here i feel privileged to introduce dr ravi a uh, global space ambassador nasa to you guys we feel very privileged to have you sir for this session today dr ravi currently serves as a foreign national tour guide and global space ambassador for john f kennedy space center in florida in 2019 he was nominated by the astronaut and held the position of solar system ambassador for nasa jet propulsion laboratory in california in the 28 plus years he served at nasa dr margasem has worked on many rocket programs including the space shuttle atlas delta titan x33 stardust ares 1x and iss earlier as the project system engineer he was responsible for transporting the space shuttle stack to the pad and getting it ready for the launch he was he was also participated in the root cause analysis of the columbia shuttle launch pad modification dr margasem has received numerous awards during his 40 plus years of professional engineering career in the united states In 1996 he was awarded NASA prestigious silver Snoopy astronaut award for exceptional engineering and innovation on the space shuttle the award was a Snoopy pin that traveled to space and brought back by the astronaut Pamela Mellora who presented it to him he had also received much commendation from international universities and foreign space agencies Dr Margasem has supported NASA Kennedy Space Center as an official VIP tour guide and international public speaker for the public affair organization since 1990 in in this capacity he has provided technical and historical tour to astronauts and their families foreign ambassador government dignitaries nato ministry military officials and international visitor He hosted President Abdul Kalam, Indian Ambassador and ISRO Chief during the Kalpana Chawla maiden launch to the space. He was the NASA Kennedy Space Center press and media scout for the crew, director and actor of Bollywood movie title Swadesh. He has traveled and lectured in over 40 plus country and six continent, many corporation like Apple and Boeing, 100 plus university globally like of cambridge oxford mit and space agencies like isro esa jaxa and russian space agency so his mission in the life is to create masters shaping today youth into tomorrow leaders his passion is to mentor students from all over the world in closing he lives by the motto i am the past because i am the appreciation for the life experience i got i am the present because i have learned to be humble while gaining knowledge i am the future because i have to impart my wisdom to the generation ahead sir welcome to this session and we are really very honored to have you with us for this webinar i would also like to mention my fellow colleagues uh, webhav ankur and siddharth from outreach and team marketing for their support during this entire process from the time so we got this approval and today where we are so i now request uh, professor uh, wick sir to formally take over the session and uh, have this forward thank you thank you professor joshi it's a, it's a real uh, honor to have uh, such a eminent speaker uh, ravi magashaham from uh, nasa so we have just had a, a a very interesting chat with him and uh, Uh, also being of indian origin she makes it even a great delight to have a fellow indian having reached a huge heights and the talk sounds uh, just incredible so i i think without further ado i i will just uh, 
requested Ravi to make his presentation and tell us about all the wonderful things that he has done uh, for NASA and for space exploration. So Ravi, please, uh, please uh, start your lecture. Uh, thank you, Dean. Uh, thank you. I really appreciate it. Uh, it's a great privilege and honor to be here with uh, you all at U UPES. Uh, before starting the lecture, I want to uh, pray Lord Ganesha, but also uh, uh, pray for my dad and mom who really brought me into this world and tried to give me the best education. So that's where they brought me to. And so I just want to start the lecture with that. Uh, uh, thanks for letting people know that I'm an Indian. <laughs> yes. Like, like Raj Kapoor says, you know, Mera juta hai Japani. so my job is NASA, but my <laughs> dil firbi hai Hindustani. So excellent, I can speak uh, Hindi still very well and read and write. So <laughs> thank you again. Uh, we, uh, we have a lot of slides. Uh, I just want to start and uh, with your permission, I want to start the slides uh, and try to keep uh, uh, it moving very fast because uh, you said, uh, come back to uh, you peasant, uh, keep some you know, secrets there. So Yes, uh, let's work yes. on it. Yes, uh, absolutely, okay. absolutely. Let's go ahead, uh, Siddharth. Uh, we are going very fast, so you know, let's uh, do it. Uh, go back to the first slide. Uh, first slide, sorry. NASA slide, yeah. So just like NASA, I want you to have your name as a gold standard. If you forget everything what I say today, I want your name to be the best in the world. Uh, man's mind grows in space. It's allowed to operate. And for me, NASA was the space and... Uh, Universe was the space. Next slide. Launching Kalpana and launch, it's like launching imagination, basically. Uh, your uh, imagination is like the highest kite you can fly, basically. It's more important than knowledge. We want to reach our destination mostly with wrong maps, unsteady thinking, or poor vision or knowledge. And that we have to change. And that's the only way to reach. Uh, uh, Kalpana became an astronaut. I became the astronaut maker for her. So it doesn't matter what goals and uh, ambitions you have in life. Next slide. So it's a nice uh, quote by Mahatma Gandhi. We must become the change we want to see basically. Uh, why? Because one of the great qualities of an astronaut is a curiosity. And uh, basically they want to go or they have gone where nobody has gone basically. As aerospace engineers, aspiring engineers, you must know what engineers do and understand failures. Uh, that's one of the things uh, India doesn't teach. And I, did, I was not taught in India also about failures. They, we were always abhorred for failures. Next slide. So basically, uh, as far as mission success goes in NASA, next slide. As far as mission success goes, it starts with safety. And I'm a safety engineer, but also a good, very good engineer. And safety starts with engineering excellence. Space is a very forgiving environment. One mistake you do, you are completely dead. You can make thousands of right decisions, but one mistake will really, really make or break you, basically. So uh, for me, uh, we'll talk a little bit more later. While fate denied me of dream of flying, uh, I navigated my own destiny by making the flights of others possible. Next slide. So uh, this is a nice quote by... Uh, Stephen Hawking, we want to spread our wings uh, because uh, it is very important that you know mankind has to survive. And uh, the only way to do that is to spread into space. And that's one of the reasons we want to explore space. Uh, 100,000 years ago, mankind left Africa and came uh, and spread all over the uh, earth. And nothing significantly happened uh, for past 60,000 years. In the last 60 years, you know, we are completely changed the way man, mankind has worked and lived in, you know, in space and has completely uh, uh, changed the technological um, uh, map, of, map of the world, basically. Next slide. So this is a picture of Milky Way, 100,000 light years. Uh, we are talking about, uh, uh, you know, basically just to, just to travel uh, uh, the Milky Way, it will take billions of years, basically. And we are just a tiny speck in a Milky Way ocean, which comprises of billions of stars. Next slide. So basically, it's very important for you to understand that mankind, uh, uh, like, like our uh, uh, esteemed uh, colleague here, we sent, uh, sent probes to uh, like Voyager 1, Voyager 2. 
uh, uh, beyond the solar system. Now they are traveling uh, 16 billion miles away from Earth. Just to get to our next uh, uh, galaxy, we are talking about almost 48 billion years to reach Andromeda galaxy. So just want to impress upon you that space, what we are, we are Earth is also in space and we are moving around in that same space as the other planets and stuff like that. Next slide. Earth is a cradle of mankind. Next slide. Uh, click on that. Click on that. Next slide. Click on that. Yeah. Earth is a cradle of mankind, but one can cannot live in the cradle forever. You know, a ship looks beautiful in the harbor, but that's not ships are built for. When Columbus sailed from uh, uh, the shores of uh, 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 Europe, you know, he wanted to uh, look, for, look for the world, find a best route to India and stuff like that. So rocket looks beautiful on the launch pad, but that's not what rocket is built for, basically. This is a beautiful picture of the, the 900 light years of the galactic, uh, uh, our galaxy and uh, the Milky Way. And it shows about 26,000 light years uh, away, some of the central points of the galaxy. It's amazing that, you know, in my own lifetime, I've not only sent probes to different planets in this universe, but also sent beautiful, beautiful telescopes like Hubble and Spitzer and other things. Next slide. But what happened really? Why uh, mankind changed uh, to, to look into space? Because, you know, we are done with exploring the Earth. Now it was, you know, really uh, trying to look at uh, what is out there, you know, basically in the space. So we always try to explore. Mankind's DNA has exploration abilities to explore. So really we needed a kick in the pants and that's what happened in 1957 when Sputnik, you know, it was a tiny ball, 180 pounds, uh, 23 uh, inches uh, wide, you know, and amazing that, that one small ball going around the world really kicked the pants out of uh, America and the world, basically. Um, Dr. Um, uh, Robert Cabana, who is my center director, and I have a great respect for him as an astronaut. He says, from small beginnings come great things. This 180 ball, pound ball changed the whole world. You, have a, you see a beautiful picture of the space shuttle riding a uh, Boeing 747. That is exactly my whole life in career in America. I worked for Boeing, one of the best aerospace companies, then worked for NASA, one of the best space companies in the world. And obviously we built the ISS. Next slide. So uh, NASA is a global leader in exploration. You see all the arrows pointed there. There's a reason for that. Those are the things I worked on, you know, in, the, in, in just uh, the 30 years I worked at NASA. I was in the hi history making era of space exploration. You know, can you imagine coming first year and launching uh, uh, Magellan to Venus or Galileo to uh, uh, Jupiter? or uh, Ulysses to the sun, or Cassini to Saturn. I mean, this is amazing, amazing. And then launching the Hubble, launching Spitzer, launching many, many other probes, building the ISS, you know, in the 30 year time frame. And that is what I'm saying. You know, don't uh, just put a note on uh, LinkedIn or somewhere, just say, hey, I took a course, you know, Dr. Ravi's course on space. No, no, no. You do something extraordinary, you know. I, I, you know, me and Kalpana Chawla have given you the way, the jumping off platform that we can go from India as two unknown people and be, become the best in America. Now, this, we are the best and best of American Space Agency, okay? Uh, uh, we are extraordinary people. We did extraordinary things. And I want to tell you that not because I want to be boasting about myself, but I want to tell you because I want to give you a kick in the back, just like the Sputnik did, you know? Uh, so uh, I want you to explore what mankind has. The next slide. We have been to moon six times, NASA. I was not there during the moon landing. Next slide. Uh, uh, we also have uh, gone and landed on Mars. Uh, sorry, previous slide. Uh, landed on Mars. Uh, previous slide. Okay. Uh, we have landed on Mars eight times. No other country has done that. 50 times people have attempted. I think you went back one. <laughs> the slide on uh, yeah, moon landing. Next slide. Okay, this one, yeah, keep it there. Uh, so we sent probes to the solar system, as I said, we launched windows to the universe in the Hubble. We have given you a picture of Mother Earth from the moon. And uh, we have given pictures from not only nearby, uh, several hundred thousand miles, but from 
you know uh, from far away pla uh, planets like like uh, in this case saturn uh, you know, this is the pale blue dot you know which carl sagan said uh, and this from the cassini aircraft which took a picture of mother earth as it was flying away basically to jupiter i mean to saturn next slide so we built the international space station this is uh, uh, you know in my lifetime this is 1 million pound half a million kilos one module by module like lego set we sent it in the uh, uh, earth's atmosphere 3 300 miles up you know uh, each launch cost me half a billion dollars 100 million dollars per space shuttle launch uh, so basically space shuttle was a cathedral of technology because of space shuttle we could build something like the international space station next slide so talking a little bit about uh, rocket pioneers uh, uh, as i told you earlier my own fate uh, never denied me of flying as a kid i wanted to fly coming back from kabul i saw a indian movie sangam and uh, i fell in love with raj kapoor and his role as a pilot in the movie i said if i become a uh, pilot like raj kapoor i can marry a beautiful girl and go around the world it was never meant to be you know but but like just like classic uh, what leonardo da vinci said uh if you can't fly make the flight of others possible and that's what i did next slide so really uh this is a nice quote from national geographic uh next slide yeah okay good uh really we want to free ourselves from earth's embrace we want to sprout wings uh and uh you know definitely we want uh to see the earth in the from the eyes of the condor so like leonardo da vinci he built the helicopter now next week we are going to be flying a helicopter on mars how great that is i used to work in boeing helicopters i designed many helicopters um, the chinook the v22 tilt rotor now i'm seeing my own uh, agency sending helicopter on mars this is amazing to live in this kind of environment uh, next slide so the world of rocketry goes back to tipu sultan uh, dr kalam uh, our esteemed colleague from Uh, isro and you know one of uh, most revered person in the world for me uh, he uh, said that you know he saw tipu sultan's pictures on the wall in uh, one of the nasa centers and i was doing the research and i found out that you know going back to chinese the chinese started the rocket thousands of years ago or maybe 800 years ago then india it brought was brought to india and some of the uh, tipu sultan's people were fighting the british and they used that and then the Uh, the british copied that and they were fighting against the americans and the american national anthem was written by francis scott key in 1814 as we were getting bombarded by by the british people with the same arrows which tipu sultan used on the british so amazing technology uh, tipu sultan innovated also because he modified the rockets next slide uh, really the rocketry became uh, possible by uh, Uh, many people in uh, for america uh, because i'm nasa i'm talking a little bit about more um, about americans robert goddard was our uh, 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 person who started with launching the liquid fuel rocket just like the apollo 11 rocket uh, and there was a quote there it says since there is nothing for rockets to push against in outer space space flight would be always impossible uh, uh, what is what a great quote you know <laughs> and we may nasa is all about making impossible possible you know when you read the word impossible it says i am possible how you read the english you know and uh, that's how beautiful english language is and it can have many 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 meanings so the next slide talks a little bit about the uh, v22 rocket which is a precursor uh, uh, of the german war machine after the second world war using operation paper clip we bought von braun to america with many of uh, his Uh, drawings and designs and then that was the precursor uh, we uh, russians stole some of the engineers from germany and we stole somebody and so they were brought to america and really von braun was the father of uh, uh, nasa basically and you know uh, apollo 11 rocket uh, so we talked a little bit about sputnik uh, next slide uh, so we we talked a little bit about sputnik which gave us a kick in the pants uh, uh, for us innovation next slide uh, really what happened was so after sputnik uh, whole america was really in trouble and kennedy was just a president at that time uh, uh, it is uh, i revered him when i was a kid growing up in mumbai going to school and you know people 
would talk about JFK, but I never knew that one day, maybe a few, uh, 20 years later, 10 years later, I would come back to America, come to America as, a, as a small boy, and I would work in a, a center where man went to moon, which is the John F. Kennedy Space Center, which is named after him. But we, you know, he, he made a very bold uh, message to the whole world. You know, when you want to uh, achieve something in life, you know, keep it simple, stupid, like, I know, uh, that's the message uh, we want to make sure people uh, have a goal. Man, moon, 1970, how hard it is. You know, we can, even a kid understands, okay? He understands man, he understands moon and 1970. It's so simple, but it made a profound implication on what it meant for the Americans and the entire world to beat the Soviets and be, be the first person to go in space. You know, nobody remembers about the second person. Everybody knows that the first Indian woman in space is Kalpana Chawla. Nobody remembers who is the second person. They don't have to know that, you know, because first is always, you know, you can never get a second chance to become the first in something. So, um, but, you know, just a joke about uh, uh, JFK coming to NASA Center and the janitor was working. He said, hey, janitor, what are you doing here? You know, he said, you know, don't you see what I'm doing? I'm launching man to moon, you know? And uh, Kennedy was surprised. He said, this guy is cleaning the floor, but he's part of the space program, you know? And he was saying that, okay, within the um, year of 1970, within a decade, we have to send man to moon. And NASA did it, next slide. So on July 16, 1969, uh, uh, we lifted off on the same launch pad, Complex 39A, which I was very privileged to work. As soon as I came from Boeing to NASA in 89, I was, my first job was to be working on the same launch pad where man went to moon. I met the Neil Armstrong, I met Buzz Aldrin, I shook hands with him. Uh, next time you see, you can rub off my hands and you would say that you'd met uh, you know, Buzz Aldrin. So next slide. So really, uh, this is a nice quote by Robert Goddard. Uh, it is difficult to say what is impossible for the dream of yesterday is the hope of today and the reality of tomorrow. Uh, so that is what uh, uh, my boss always said, how can sky be the limit when there are footprints on the moon? So the space exploration uh, which NASA uh, uh, is going on with NASA extends far reaches of uh, space. Uh, we built ISS, we went to moon a couple of times. Uh, now we are putting, you know, uh, going to Lagrange point and put, putting James Webb telescope. We have already gone to Mars you know, many times. We are working on near-Earth asteroids and stuff like that. So NASA extends its reach into the far unknowns without fear of failure. Next slide. So basically, uh, let's talk a little bit about failures. Uh, next slide. So uh, one of the nice quotes from uh, Juan Carmen, who's a JPL director, scientists study the world as it is and engineers create the world which has never been. So this is what I want you as aerospace engineers to do design something which is nobody has seen it, nobody has done it. And Space Shuttle, for me, which I worked on it for 100 launches, amazing, amazing uh, time, 700 astronauts to launch, build the International Space Station, was amazing part of my life. It was a vehicle uh, uh, in part to broaden the knowledge of the universe. You know, Space Shuttle could put 50,000 pounds or 25,000 kilos in space, seven astronauts, nobody can do that. It can retrieve satellites, you know, launch satellites, retrieve satellites, repair satellites in space, and build the International Space Station and stuff like that. No vehicle today can do it. it my mom, mother, remember, mothers are always right. My mother would say, there's Pushpa Kriman, it would come from space, and God will come and land on the Earth. And I, mom, I said, mom, that never happened. I never saw a Pushpa <laughs> You know, uh, mothers always said, yes, it was, it is there, it is there. And when I came to NASA, and I see this beautiful bird, the Space Shuttle Columbia, uh, or one of the five space shuttles we had would go to space like in, in uh, uh, as a rocket, come back to Earth like a bird and land anywhere in the world. It is amazing feat of uh, engineering. I'll tell you, it will, there will be never in the history of mankind, there will be no other shuttle. Next slide. So what do you want to become really? Uh, uh, are you passionate about becoming aerospace engineers? Uh, click on it again. Uh, one more time, click on the slide, next slide, forward. Yeah, so basically um, you can become an astronaut, you can become a physicist. You know, you don't have to become whatever you want. Uh, uh, I mean, you don't have to become an astronaut. You don't have to become an astronaut maker like me. You can become anything you want, but if you 
are passionate, be the best in whatever you do. Next slide. So rocket launching is very, very dangerous. Uh, as an astronaut, uh, it's one of the most dangerous jobs in the world. And um, uh, second most dangerous job was mine, launching rockets from the launch pad, basically. It comes up with a tremendous risk. Uh, rocket launching is like I call it World War III uh, with gravity and hidden hazards of both ground and the vacuums of uh, space, basically. As I said, anything you see up there, even during liftoff, uh, you can get uh, blown up like the Challenger accident in 1986. Next slide. So NASA, uh, uh, it's a great, great agency. I'm very proud of it. I go around the world. I just have to tell people, hey, I'm Dr. Ravi from NASA. And everybody says, great, great, great. You know, but they respect me. Not because I'm Dr. Ravi, it's because the name NASA. And that's the same kind of name I want you to have. Your family name is very important. Uh, I want it to be the best in the world. It's a, like a gold standard, I think I told you. But NASA is, uh, is a remarkable story of remarkable achievements, but also it has earth-shattering failures, spectacular failures, which really, I'm talking about rockets failing right after liftoff in the early part of the program. Columbia, Challenger accident, we killed astronauts. Apollo 1 fire, which was very sad when, when we put pure oxygen. And then we had Apollo 13, almost we call it a uh, uh, near disaster or you know, uh, spectacular. There's a success, there's a failure, then you have a successful failure, which is something like Apollo 13. Uh, then we have, we, you know, look at the rocket in the bottom here, you know, Columbia, where Kalpana Chawla died in 2003. A beautiful, beautiful vehicle, $5 billion and comes back, you know, 10 days ago, I put it in space and uh, 10 days later, it comes back with 200,000 pieces uh, you see on the ground. It is very, very sad to see something like that. Next slide. So failure is always, uh, 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 you know, part of, integral part of what we do in, in, in space and uh, life. Failure is central to engineering. Every single failure you engineers do is a failure calculation because we never know what is a failure criteria. And uh, successful engineering is always about understanding failure, how things fail. And that is what is not taught in India. You know, I was never taught in India to fail, but failure is very good actually because you learn from failure. Every single person in the whole world, including Thomas Edison, thousand times he failed, but he never said I've failed. He said, I know how not to fail or not to do things. Uh, this is a very sad day when we lost uh, Challenger in 1986. I was not in NASA. In my time uh, uh, of 100 launches, I never lost a rocket uh, for liftoff, but a landing, we lost one. I can always say landing is not my job, but we are a team and we take responsibility for what happened to Kalpana Chawla on that fateful day in 2003. Uh, success is a lousy teacher. It seduces people into thinking we cannot lose. Thomas Edison made a comment saying, I, I know a thousand ways not to do something. You know, um, In life, a uh, lot of times, you know, Henry Ford, uh, Ford said it the best. Failure is simply an opportunity to start uh, in a more intelligent fashion or more intelligent way. Next slide. So really uh, what happened here uh, uh, basically is, uh, you know, a foam uh, hit uh, the rocket uh, and we had many, many uh, uh, you know, times the foam had hit and some of the managers made a wrong decision. So in case of Challenger, we had an O-ring problem. You can read all about it. Or next time I come to Dehradun, we'll have a big session on failures. <laughs> so uh, I'll continue with that. Uh, as I said earlier, next slide. Uh, failure is central to uh, engineering. So we need to understand failures. So when you do failures, like, you know, you're going through a maze. So what happens in the maze? You know, the uh, faster you go into the maze, you turn left, right, and you come to a dead end. And you turn right again to go again, you know. So basically you're trying to uh, fail and then uh, continue your journey. So keep on doing that many, many times. So the faster you uh, map the maze, map the unknown, you're going to be successful. So don't be afraid of failures. You know, fa I failed my, my, myself uh, in 1969 as Apollo uh, uh, 13 was happening in uh, 70. Uh, uh, you know, I, I failed as, as uh, NASA was sending, finishing the last part of the Apollo program. I failed in the exams and uh, my mom had to take me from Mumbai and put me in Bangalore to study engineering. 
and I couldn't even get admission in some of the colleges. So uh, just want to impress upon you that, you know, it's nothing, a failure is nothing new to uh, me or uh, uh, Dr. Kalam or uh, Von Brown or anybody else. So it's all common to all of us and we do go through failures. But what is important is get up and go, learn from the failures. You know, next slide. So I told you earlier, mission success starts with safety and I'm a safety engineer, I have been a safety engineer for safety systems engineer. So for me, excellence is everything. I told you in my 100 launches and 400 payloads to the International Space Station, never lost one rocket except for landing. I sent, um, uh, we built the International Space Station, every single module fit in space. That is the beauty. So engineering or engineers do change and shape the world. So like there's a uh, saying, a Chinese saying, if you want to plant a tree, uh, uh, you have to put a seed 20 years ago. If you haven't done that, put it now. Uh, that's same with your career. You know, if you want to be the best NASA engineer or work for NASA, you know, you have to put the seed right now. And um, I prefer uh, engineering because it brand, it looks at science and mathematics and uses that to come up with the end product of technology. So whatever you see in this world is a product in the end, you know. And who makes it? Engineers. So scientists are great. I'm not. I hats off to them. They have theories. Uh, next slide. But but engineering is something we do out of uh, 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 complete areas where, where people haven't seen. So every great advance in science and technology comes from the audacity of imagination, um, uh, which is the name of uh, Kalpana Chawla, Kalpana. So it's, it's our imagination. So let your imagination run wild. Next slide. So basically, uh, uh, one of the NASA managers, he always said that, that if I had given you a billion dollars to come up with the radar, uh, I mean, microwave oven, uh, to design a microwave oven, which everybody uses in the world today. I use it every day 10 times. It would have not po been possible because it came from radar. One of the engineers working on the uh, radar technology, he put uh, his chocolate in a candy in his pocket. And suddenly when he was working on it, it started melting. And then he was wondering what happened to this? And that's what ha happened is basically the chocolate melted because of the microwave coming and in, 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 in impacting. So look, look how, what happens. I mean, I give you a billion dollars and you can never come up with a microwave oven as a uh, engineering concept or a tool which people can use it, you know. In the end, you know, we've designed tools. Next slide. Uh, before even the loss of thermodynamics, we were building steam engines in England and other places. My, believe it or not, I never worked in India after undergrad. I came in 75 as a tourist to America. I'm still here after so many years. Uh, but what is interesting is my first job uh, as a uh, employee was uh, in the railroads, you know. And you you may say, you know, what the hell is has uh, railroads to do with NASA? You know, I'll tell you a little bit later. Every single thing, including solid rocket boosters, and most of the pad uh, operations were done on the railroad track. So instantaneously, I became a leading expert on on NASA rocket launch pad because I knew everything about how tribology or friction lubrication and uh, wheel and rail work. Basically, next slide. So even before. The first flight, uh, uh, there are no aerodynamic laws in, in the world. Next slide. Uh, so basically, uh, next slide. Hello? <laughs> okay. Uh, so even before uh, the loss of aerodynamics were there, we built uh, uh, what you call uh, the Wright Brothers flu, basically. So engineers always need to solve critical problems and stuff like that. And that is what uh, uh, I want to tell you that don't wait for theory and science and stuff like that to need uh, innovation. Innovation comes. Uh, it wants innovation comes when you go beyond the known uh, into the unknown. There may be trap doors. There may be blind alleys. There may be many many unknowns. And that is what you are trying to map and uh, map the maze. Just like we talked about earlier. If you go in a maze, you make mistakes. The faster you fail, faster you innovate. Basically. Uh, Innovation requires you to look, open your eyes and look around, see what is not there, you know. So uh, uh, Mr. Sado, one of the guys who designed the wheels on, uh, uh, you know, uh, suitcases, he went one day to a third world country in uh, South America, I guess, and he saw they were taking this, his suitcase and putting it on a bullock cart or a, or a uh, horse cart and taking it out. So he said, why don't I put wheels on the, um, you know, uh, uh, suitcases, and he became a billionaire, you know. So that is what we talk about. Next slide. So this, uh, you know, uh, 
is basically we want to talk a little bit about two journeys which started from shores of India. Mine started from Gateway of India, really, and uh, Kalpana came from northern part of India. We had a common passion, pursuit of flight. We didn't know each other, but our journey ended at the same destination, NASA Kennedy Space Center in 1996. Uh, definitely, she did mighty things. She was fearless, and she became an astronaut. But that's okay, because I took the path which was never traveled. I was the only uh, first Indian to work on the launch pad where NASA, there were uh, no Indian was allowed to work on the complex launch pad operations, you know, until that time. So it was coincident or luck or, you know, hard work brought me to the launch pad, which let me become her astronaut maker, but not only her, but I sent 700 astronauts and 100 rockets to space. So that is my legacy. The legacy was to launch the first Indian woman to space, you know, uh, that, that just next slide. So basically, uh, it, it was important uh, for you uh, to, to believe in, uh, think, believe, dream, and dare. Uh, your thoughts becomes words, words become actions, actions become habits, habits become character, character becomes your destiny. You know, you know when you look at the caterpillar, there's nothing in the caterpillar it says you are a beautiful, you're going to be a beautiful butterfly. You who are listening to me, they're all beautiful butterfly. You are going to be a beautiful butterfly, but you don't know that. And that's what I'm telling you. You know, be be whatever you want, but be the best in whatever you do. Next slide. So basically, uh, let's quickly go through a uh, special ground processing uh, overview. The reason I'm bringing this is not because I want to uh, show you all the beauty about Kennedy Space Center, but talk about some of the most difficult part of launching rockets and how we launch rockets with all the problems we had, you know. And we, when, when a rocket has 3 million parts, how do you launch something like that 3 million parts without going wrong? You can't even drive a car which has 30,000 parts or something like that, you know? So that is what we talk about here. Um, next slide. So for the right stuff, uh, which we call uh, the astronauts to go into space safely, you need the most reliable right staff on the ground. And that's where I come in. My team comes in basically. I was a systems engineer, safety engineer, not only for the rockets, to integrate all the rockets, which we'll show in pictures right now quickly, but also I want to show you, uh, make you appreciate how beautiful uh, uh, or how complex it is. And I'll tell you the problems we face sometimes in what we did. Next slide. So uh, my journey at Kennedy Space Center was as a vibroacoustics engineer, meaning measuring sound and vibration, a systems engineer, uh, why NASA is the best in the world? Because we are the best systems engineering and integration people. The shuttle you see there, you know, it has 3 million parts. We can put everything together. And uh, that is the uh, hardest part of the world. The perseverance, ingenuity, all that thing come together, basically. Next slide. So here's the uh, uh, slide I want to show you. You need high imagination to do this job. Curiosity, intelligent uh, dream, audacity, uh, you need passion, you need tenacity, many, many aspects to make it happen. Next, uh, click on that again. So shuttle has been the cathedral of in uh, uh, innovation. This is a beautiful main space shuttle main engine. The two reasons why shuttle flew is because of the tiles underneath the body of the shuttle and the main engine, which you see here, which flows the same James Bond fuel called the liquid oxygen, liquid hydrogen. Next slide, uh, click on it. Yeah, this is the orange tank which has a liquid oxygen on the top and liquid hydrogen, which fuels this rocket engine. Next slide. Uh, this is the picture of the space shuttle solid. Uh, click on it, yeah, uh, and click on it again. Uh, so basically you will see the solid rocket booster. This solid rocket booster, it's a, oh, sorry, go back one slide. Okay, stay there. Uh, so basically the solid rocket boosters are the most powerful solid rocket boosters. And because we, we you know, uh, they, uh, once you light them, you're going somewhere. You cannot have a throttle control. That's why NASA put the liquid rocket engines, which have throttle control. One time, uh, this uh, thrust of the rockets is almost 7 million pounds, you know, or three and a half million kilos. And we stopped the whole launch at three, uh, less than one second. If I had gone over one second, the rocket would go somewhere, basically. Because once you light the solids, there's no return. And uh, one interesting story about railroads. So these solid rocket boosters are seven segmented and they come in donuts. 
and each segment is separate and we put them together in NASA. And these segments came from Utah, you know, far away from Florida, and they came on railroad tracks. And in the old days, all the railroad bridges and tracks were you know, uh, a broad gauge. And that broad gauge was designed based on a horse cart. And the horse cart, what does it have? Two horses. And the distance between the two behinds or bottoms of the horses designed uh, or was used to build the railroads, which was used to build the solid rocket booster. So a lot of times we in NASA, the people kid us and saying, hey, you know, your whole solid rocket design came from uh, the distance between two horses back, you know, two behinds of horses. So anyway, some interesting uh, saying here. Next slide. So uh, let's look at uh, the, the next slide. This is the entire shuttle processing. So you have landing on the top left and then uh, launching on the top right. And this is the, all the integration part. And we'll go through the uh, many, many uh, sequences. So basically there are three parts to the shuttle. Uh, one is the main uh, vehicle, which is looks like the orbiter, uh, which is what we call as Columbia. And then we also talk about the solid rocket boosters as an element, the liquid engine, uh, the orange tank as an element. And then we integrate all this, okay? And the whole stack is almost uh, 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 2 million kilos, almost, you know. So how do you operate all this? So we build the biggest building in the world uh, by volume, you know, second largest building in the world. Uh, and we integrated all these parts coming from various parts of the country. Uh, so this is a brilliant, brilliant uh, uh, piece of engineering NASA people did. And every day I went to work, I would see some aspects of this. Next slide. So now what we are going to do is uh, quickly run through some of the slides. Uh, I'll keep on saying next slide and you hit and, I'll, and uh, we'll go a little bit faster here. Uh, next slide. So basically there's a Marshall Space Flight Center where we do the orange tanks. Next slide. So this orange tank is moved by barges. Uh, this is a, a also solid rocket booster, Marshall Space Flight Center, uh, flight center des designs it and manages it. Next slide. Yeah, keep on going. Next slide. Okay, this is the main engine, uh, which was done in uh, some other center, Stennis Space Center. Johnson Space Center is in charge of the rockets. Next slide. So this is uh, a tank, uh, uh, neutral buoyancy tank where astronauts are uh, tra done training for space in Houston. Next slide. So this is the control center. Next slide. And then finally, you see the Kennedy Space Center. That's the launch operation. So all these people are doing many things. NASA has about 1 million people working all over the world, but everything comes to Kennedy Space Center. Next slide. So Kennedy Space Center is really the hub of everything. Uh, next slide. Okay, uh, I can stay there. Uh, basically, uh, you see the dot right there. I'm very close to about 50 miles away from there. Uh, that's where Orlando, Florida is, and I live there. But Kennedy Space Center was my home base. And that is the most uh, beautiful place in the world. Uh, it's a barrier island. It's a national wild refuge. Uh, 50, 500 types of uh, birds, animals, reptiles, mammals, all came, came over there. And we launched people from all walks of life, including kings, queens, ambassadors, uh, four-star generals, astronauts. Uh, you name it, they have walked through that uh, holy place or holy uh, uh, area of uh, maybe about 140,000 acres. I have 5,000 alligators, which are taken over uh, uh, and they're sort of guarding us. You know, they're our uh, guardians, basically, you know, the gatekeepers. So next slide. So uh, we built our own, uh, this is the launch facilities. That's a VAB or the vehicle assembly building. That's one of the largest buildings in the world. In the back, in the center, you see the launch pad complex 39A and next to it would be the complex 39B. So they're about three miles away from the VAB and we have to move the rocket about three miles and we are moving about 18 million pounds or 9 million kilos to the launch pad. Next slide. Next slide. So this is, we built our own runway. This is the longest runway in the world. Three mile long runway. Next slide. Uh, keep on going. Next slide. So basically uh, the shuttle comes, we have to take it up uh, by cranes and then uh, bring it back to our office. 
And the reason we built the three mile long runway is because we wanted to make sure that uh, the shuttle is a glider. It uh, doesn't have an engine where you reverse the thrust uh, like a plane. So basically that's what we were doing. Next slide. So uh, we also use the solid rocket booster. We have our own ships. Next slide. So these uh, solid rocket boosters uh, fall in the Atlantic Ocean. Next slide. We bring them back uh, to our office and then we retrieve them using acoustic pinging mechanisms. And then, you know, we refurbish that. Next slide. Uh, these are the ships and we refurbish them and they use it again and again. So this is the reusable part. The only the orange tank is expended. Next slide. So this is uh, uh, where we put the uh, donuts or each of the solid rocket boosters and put them together for launch readiness. Next slide. So this is the railroad uh, system where we build the, bring the solid rocket boosters from Utah. Next slide. This is the orange tank. Next slide. Uh, some of the solid rocket boosters again. And they're all coming to VAB as a central point. Next slide. So this is where we process the orbiter, which is the plane looking like thing or the Columbia, you know, which you seen in the pictures. Next slide. So it's like a 100,000 class clean room Every single aspect of the vehicle is taken out after the launch and then refurbished together. Next slide. They keep on going fast, yeah. Yeah, so basically this is the operation. Then we bring the external tank also on uh, uh, barge canal system. Next slide. And then uh, next slide. So this is where the tank comes. Next slide, keep on going. And then everything comes to a vehicle assembly building. And each one of these parts are integrated into the space shuttle. See, here is the, one of the most difficult parts. We are talking about a $5 billion uh, item you're lifting. <laughs> and how do you lift something like that? We have to have 300 ton cranes and stuff like that. And then we, are, we integrate everything. Next slide. So then we put everything on this crawler transporter. So this, uh, uh, Mobile launcher itself is weighs nine million pounds or four and a half million kilos. Next slide. We have a crawler transporter, which uh, almost which itself is about three million pounds, right on the top here. It's about three million uh, three million uh, kilos. I'm sorry, uh, six million pounds. And the next, you'll see the stack, the whole stack. Next slide. Uh, this is uh, the nine million pound machine on top. The mobile launcher on the bottom is six million pound crawler transporter. So the whole thing is about 15 million pounds. What kind of roadbed you have to design to even carry 18 million pounds or nine million kilos? You look at the man sit standing there and you can see how big is the whole thing. Next slide. So this is the launch pad. Uh, how do you react to uh, almost a three and a half million uh, kilos of thrust? You have to have massive amount of concrete. Next slide. This is uh, the water system. When uh, we had the Swadesh movie uh, shooting happened in uh, Kennedy Space Center, we did the water system, uh, uh, deluge system for them. This is a payload coming and the payload will be inserted in the rocket. Payload is, can, can be Hubble telescope or a probe going to moon or I mean uh, to, to the space station or whatever, or one of the things. So that is the launch control center. Next slide. So basically we integrated all this. Uh, go ahead. So launch control center is where NASA uh, safety and all the engineers come together and they are making sure that the flight is ready to go. Next slide. So slowly here. Uh, basically uh, in my own time, uh, the first month, First year I was in NASA, I launched Magellan spacecraft. This is a robotic spacecraft to Venus. Next slide. The same year we launched uh, Galileo, I mean Ulysses to the sun. Next slide. 
and then we launched Galileo spacecraft to uh, uh, Jupiter. Next slide. So I just want to impress upon you some of the Hubble Space Telescope. Not only we sent it uh, in 1990, this, in the second year I was in Kennedy Space Center, but also all the repair missions I was involved with, basically. Next slide. Next slide. Yeah. So basically, these are beautiful pictures of the Hubble Space Telescope, looking at a lot of nebulae or uh, you know the entire universe system. Uh, we are looking at basically uh, uh, we are looking at International Space Station here. Uh, every single aspect of the International Space Station modules were taken up by the uh, uh, by by the uh, uh, space shuttle. Basically, can you go back one one uh, slide? Can you go back one or two slides? One more slide. Yeah, I just want to show you. Uh, okay, go back. Go forward. Okay, this is the birth of the stars. That's where uh, the Earth started once upon a time, and it became our solar system or our galaxy. Uh, next slide. That's the birth of the stars. That's where Earth started billions of years ago, fourteen billion years ago. Next slide. This is a 100,000 class room where all the modules of the International Space Station were checked out. There's no return policy in space. Everything has, must be checked out uh, so that they can fit in space. Next slide. So, keep going. This is building the International Space Station. Now we are in space. We are also looking at some of the modules inside the uh, space station and working experiments inside the space station. You know, people ask me, why you go to space? You know, why are you wasting money? You're not watching Earth, you know, or doing anything on Earth. I, I know I tell them that ISS is the Earth observation station. You know, you can only see Dehradun from where you are. I can see the whole globe. Every 90 minutes I go around the world with ISS. I can see the entire globe and monitor it for tsunamis, earthquakes, uh, um, volcanoes or anything like that, you know, basically. So uh, this is what we are doing. It, it's a palace in the sky, but it's ma monitoring the entire earth. Who is watching Mother Earth? You know, nobody. You and me cannot watch because we are only limited to what we see next door, basically, 10 feet, 20 feet, 100 feet. But here we are seeing it from space. Next slide. best launch team in the world. And if, when everything comes together, 3 million parts come together. Okay, go. Next slide. Beautiful site, you know. Uh, I just cannot explain to you. You know, you can go to any of the videos on YouTube and see this flight. Next slide. So now we'll just uh, try to wrap up some of these uh, uh, last slides because we just have a little bit time, about fifteen minutes. That's what uh, I, I should stop around eleven, uh, about twenty minutes. So let's go. Uh, next slide. So in the end, what happens is your experience knowledge and uh, wisdom counts. So um, okay, uh, so basically uh, we, we are uh, you know looking at what uh, 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 we say that you know in rocketry, uh, a journey of 10,000 miles starts with a single dream basically you know uh, or 100,000 miles start with a 
a single dream. You know, sometimes uh, we just uh, cannot do impossible things, but we just cannot give up on those things too. The next slide. So, you know, the space exploration has really changed the mindset of the people, their intelligence, imagination, and ingenuity, like engineers like us. You know, but we are just starting, you know, we are rocket riders, astronaut makers. Uh, we, are, we have started to change the, our mankind's destiny in space because we have to live in space. Otherwise, we cannot perish, you know, in the next hundred years or thousand years or whatever Stephen Hawking says. Um, my journey started from Gateway of India, as I said, to Gateway to Space. It was a lot of details, de deviations, defeats, uh, things like that. But failure was not an option for me. I had to fight back and basically, you know, it's all about dreams and stuff like that. And uh, I, I just followed this quote, one of the people I mentor, uh, 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 you know, she wrote the thing and I just modified the words. Beautiful, beautiful quote here. Next slide. So, you know, when you, if you can't fly, then run. If you can't run, you walk. If you can't walk, crawl. But all means keep on moving. You know, when uh, uh, Shackleton went to Antarctica, he didn't have all the tools we had, but he was going to risk it. And uh, I use uh, Shackleton, I use uh, Apollo 13, and one of the ships in Sweden, Vasa, as successful failures. So there is success and there is successful failure. So what is successful failure for Apollo 13? You know, these three men were stuck beyond the physical reach of humankind, uh, almost 200,000 miles from Earth, but NASA engineers brought them back. So success because we brought the men back, failure because we were supposed to land on the moon as a mission didn't happen. But, you know, are you going to complain about it when we got the men back? No. And that is what Shackleton did with his 50 people who were stuck in Antarctica. And he went back fighting to Elephant Island and went back 800 miles to get his men back. He never made it to the pool. Sometimes, you know, it is impossible to fly without motors, but not without knowledge and skill. You can use this knowledge and skill to save people because I can always go back to the moon. I can always go back to uh, Antarctica, but I can't save these people. So people are very important to us. Next slide. And knowledge and skills are very important. Uh, in my own life, in my own career in NASA, uh, in America, I never worked in India, as I said. On the top left, you see the railroad engineering. Then I worked in mining, in helicopters, uh, commercial airplanes, then NASA, Mars exploration, working on the vibroacoustics, building the ISS, uh, working on Hubble Space Telescope. You know, it is an amazing journey. You know, I, I sometimes wonder, you know, what, was this my destiny? Or, you know, you create your own destiny. Sometimes, you know, Destiny is not a matter of chance. It's a ma matter of choice. You make a choice. And that's what will make successful. Next, next slide. So basically, you know, in doing so, uh, you have to go through many, many uh, types of education. I don't want to go through all these slides uh, in, and information, but I was a structural engineer. The most important thing people ask you when you want to work for a rocket or NASA, you know, uh, are you a team player? Even Chris Hadfield was one of the greatest astronauts for NASA. He said, why should I take you to space? You know, he said, if you are an astronaut who are going to uh, you know, compliment me in space, that's what I want. Next slide. So next slide. Yeah. So there is always uncertainty in design. So this is a helicopter resonance. I'm just showing you. Resonance is bad for NASA. Basically, in design, what happens is you are always designing to a certain criteria or deterministic criteria. But in, in general, it doesn't happen that we meet that criteria and then we fail. So this is a helicopter resonance. The same kind of resonance happens. I can't show you a rocket engine blowing up. Uh, uh, I don't have a pitch, good picture of that, but uh, this is a helicopter full scale loading, goes into resonance and fails. Uh, next slide. This is a, a picture of uh, a random noise generated by the space shuttle. Uh, why I'm showing you this picture is, uh, next slide. Why I'm showing you this picture is because noise goes everywhere. And noise, noise, just like you see the resonance in the other place, it creates a lot of frequencies. And these frequencies go and impact the uh, astronaut who is sitting inside the rocket, also the payload like Hubble Space Telescope, or all the elements of the rocket, or all the launch pad structures. So resonance goes everywhere. We generate about zero or one hertz all the way to thousand hertz of acoustic load 
uh, our frequencies of acoustic load. And these loads go into all the areas because noise travels everywhere. You know, although the speed of sound is less, 343 meters per second, but it goes everywhere and it damages everything. And that's what we are worried about. Next slide. So it can lead to acoustic, uh, acoustics can lead to structural deformation basically. And uh, one of the things which in, uh, NASA uh, uh, was working on is to make sure that the main engines don't deform uh, so severely that it can break, you know. So, uh, and unfortunately the video is very slow, but if you look at the, one of the engines on the top left here, uh, you know, it shows that the whole engine bends, you know, or buckles basically in, uh, acoustic loading and the exhaust is going at Mach 4 or 2800 you know miles per hour basically and it li literally deforms and uh, we have 1000 tubes going from uh, top to bottom and they flow liquid hydrogen and that's why this uh, engine survives 3000 degrees temperature and bending it can survive that because of the thousand uh, tubes which are using for cooling purposes next slide So, you know, this is the most important thing for all the aerospace engineers out there. Um, we'll run through this slides quickly here now. Um, the four things you need to know to become the uh, excellence in whatever you do, uh, this applies to your uh, real life also, but in engineering also. Uh, whenever you have a failure, understand the proximate cause. A lot of times the proximate cause is more technical, like Columbia, it was a foam uh, shedding or foam hit. A challenger, it was an overing problem. The root cause was human error because the managers you know, created what they call as normalization of deviance. The problem was six sigma problem. They said, no, it's a one sigma problem. It's in the family, no problem, launch it. So second part, systems thinking. You know Why NASA is the greatest in the world? Because we can put 5 million parts, 3 million parts, all working together to go to space, not just going on the road here. You know, when you do a robot or when you do a, a probe uh, or, a, or a test on the ground, it is totally different than sending it to space. So not that I'm putting you down, but I, I, what I'm trying to impress upon you is to use your full potential, full self-realization to do be, beyond what you can do, basically, you know, much more than what you can do. Don't stop at something, you know, that's what I said. Don't show me a paper saying, oh, I attended this seminar. I say, do something uh, which, which proves that you are capable of doing more. You know. uh, multidisciplinary skills, like you saw, I worked in railroads, mining, helicopters, commercial airplanes. You know, never did I know that helicopter, uh, working in helicopters like gears will help me in NASA later on in the crawler or railroads, it will help me on the launch pad. In the end, it's all about talking, failure, storytelling, basically. That's the most important thing. If you can tell the stories and document the stories, you're not going anywhere. So next slide. We talked about uh, hitting lessons of failure, Apollo 1, Hubble Space Telescope failure because it had a, a spherical aberration. So as soon as we put, uh, put it in space, it didn't work. But we had the tenacity to go and repair it. Next slide. Apollo 13 mission, we talked a little bit about that. You know, these three men were beyond the physical reach of humankind. You know, if you fall in a pool, I can give you a hand and pick you up, but not when you're 200,000 miles away from Earth. You know, so these three men were beyond the physical reach of humankind, but not beyond the reach of human intelligence, imagination, and ingenuity. With those words, Jim Kranz brought them home, basically. Next slide. So develop multidisciplinary skills. Like, you know, uh, we, we have many, many areas of uh, things, like I told you, you can be, come in, uh, work in astronaut rescue missions, ISS repair and construction, satellite capture, Hubble maintenance, building Mars, many, many things you can work on, both in space and on Earth. Next slide. And you have to reflect upon what happened. Basically, uh, you know, uh, when you have a story to tell, you know, you have to make sure that, that uh, one good example would be something like uh, um, this plane, on, uh, when, when NASA was building a plane, uh, I mean, shuttle, uh, one of the boss uh, engineers went to his boss in NASA and said, hey, boss, we have a problem. So here's a shuttle. It comes, goes up like a uh, rocket, but comes like a plane, and it lands in California or uh, Europe or somewhere because we had landing sites all over the world. 
So how do I bring this patient back home? So the manager looked at uh, the engineer and said, buy her a plane ticket. And that's what the engineer did, by put her on the top of the plane instead of inside the plane. So sometimes complex engineering problems have simple solutions. Next slide. So this is a, a, a heartbeat of a fruit fly I was working on. I sent it to space. The top one is like a, a one week old fruit fly. Um, you can click on that to see whether it works. Uh, uh, can you click on the top image? Yeah. Um, it's a video. Yeah. And the bottom image also. Yeah. Yeah, keep, keep, uh, click, click on the top image. Yeah. Yeah. So you can see the fruit fly heartbeat in space, uh, equivalent to human, uh, humans of seven years. The bottom one is a very slow moving uh, heartbeat, which is equivalent to 70 years. So uh, we are studying many, many different things. So uh, what I'm trying to impress upon you is, you know, research of all kinds are being done on the International Space Station. Next slide. So we talked a little bit about buying a plane ticket for uh, uh, the, the, uh, the space shuttle. So it's all about connecting the dots. Like you take a iPhone from Apple, it's about computer, phone, touch screen. They were all there already. What Apple did, Steve Jobs did, was putting the ideas together, connecting the dots basically. Next slide. So here's a state of the art solution. We had a woodpecker problem, which pecked about 300 holes in my rocket and I couldn't launch it after Columbia's accident. So we brought it uh, to the office and repaired it, but we couldn't get rid of the woodpeckers. So we were, NASA was looking. They sent emails all over the world uh, to see how to get rid of the woodpeckers. Somebody said, shoot the, uh, shoot the birds. We can't do it because we are in a very environmentally protected area. Then we said, uh, we'll, uh, who is the predator for woodpecker? So they found that owls were predator, but how do you train an owl? It's not a dog to train and send them after the woodpecker. So in the end, the NASA engineer came up with the idea saying, make balloons uh, filled with helium, put it on the launch pad at many places with a, a picture of owl face on that. And the birds ran away. So simple solution like that. And one time I was taking a German ambassador to, to meet him at, on the launch pad. He says, Dr. Ravi, you, you did a beautiful tour of the launch pad, but tell me why you have balloons on the launch pad, you know, whose birthday it is? <laughs> Where's the birthday cake? I said, no, there's no birthday cake. No, nobody's birthday. It's uh, the reason for that is basically to make sure there's no woodpeckers coming. Next slide. So basically, uh, let's go run through some of these slides. The next slide. So, uh, you know, uh, talking a little bit about Kalpan Chawla, uh, our timelines were totally different. Um, you know, she, I came to America in 75. She came in 82. Uh, she graduated in 81 from, uh, uh, 82 from Punjab Engineering College. I already was in Boeing at that time. Uh, 84, she came to America. 88, she graduated. 89, uh, I was already in NASA Kennedy Space Center. 89, she was in NASA Ames after graduation. Uh, she was selected as an astronaut in 1994 and 1997. I was uh, I met her in 1995, first time, and then 97 is the time when we launched uh, Kalpana for the first time, you know, on STS-87. So that time we got Indian ambassador and everybody, a lot of people came from India. Next slide. Next slide. Yeah. So this is uh, how I came to. Uh, uh, you know, being a aerospace engineer, a, a trigger after seeing the movie. And basically that led me to having my dream to continue my journey to America. And then, you know, uh, by working in Boeing and NASA, ended up with uh, working on the space program. So next slide. As I said earlier, if you can fly, maybe let others fly. That's what Leonardo da Vinci said. So failure is not the end of your journey. Instead, it's the beginning of a new journey. So uh, that's what happened to me. I failed in India, but continued this journey uh, with a better preparation. Next slide. Yeah, we need to run through the slides. So please uh, continue the slides. So it doesn't mat matter uh, what road you take, but be the best. Uh, next slide. Yeah, these are 
uh, astronaut training for Kalpana Chawla. So basically, uh, this is the astronaut uh, just before the launch. Uh, next slide. This is, she, you know, she's, this is a STS 87. I'm two feet away from her. She's going to the launch pad. It's like sending your, uh, the, your daughter to space, basically, or wedding or something like that. It's like a Rambo-like movie where, where there's so much noise and, you know, uh, 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 police and everybody. So this is Kalpana in space already on STS-87. Next slide. This is, uh, uh, you, you see on the left picture, I'm in the middle. Uh, Dan Golding was on the right side in the right picture. At that time, I spoke to the Indian, um, and Dan Golding, and we arranged for the Indian Prime Minister to talk to Kalpana Chawla in space right after she became the astronaut. So there's a trick question in NASA, when do you become an astronaut? Not when you are selected by NASA, not when you go into space, but when you lift off from the locket, even uh, on the launch pad, even half an inch, quarter inch, uh, one centimeter, one millimeter on your own rocket power, that's when you become an astronaut. So that's a trick question. Next slide. So this is uh, the crew of uh, uh, 107. The, this is when Kalpana Chawla died. So, uh, you know, in, in uh, landing basically. Uh, next slide. This is a crew picture of uh, Kalpana Chawla's uh, STS 107 mission. Yeah, next slide. So this is a beautiful launch of uh, uh, Spatial Columbia, $500 million. And you can see how pretty the launch is. Next slide. That one day the rocket takes off like that, you know, and the next day it comes, and then in 10 days it comes back like this with 200,000 pieces. It's a very bad day for, for us. Next slide. Next slide. Next slide. Yeah. Yeah. So basically, oh, sorry, you missed one. You missed two. Oh, go back one more. Go back one more. Okay. This is a $200 million museum. Uh, uh, that's where we put the Space Shuttle Atlantis. Uh, it's sitting inside the rocket center here behind uh, this building here, inside this building. Next slide. This is uh, uh, the Kalpana Chawla Memorial inside the, uh, inside the building, right under the rocket. Uh, and this is a launch director, uh, Mike Kleinbach. Next slide. So uh, next slide. Okay, so this is, uh, keep holding here. So basically this is the rocket as it sits in the launch pad. You know, you see the Columbia Challenger, Challenger Memorial is on the left here. And uh, it so happened that uh, Michael Soluri who took a picture of me and wrote a book later on called Infinite Words. Uh, before all this happened, we didn't even know that uh, Atlantis is going to stay here and have a museum. So eventually that led to, the book led to uh, uh, Michael being asked to send his pictures for the museum. And out of the million or two million pictures he took, he sent about 30 pictures and one of them is mine. So my picture is right under Atlantis overlooking Kalpana Chawla Memorial. So uh, it is so, um, so uh, subtle that, you know, it's kind of sometimes it's scary when I walk through there that I'm sharing space with Atlantis, the rocket, the astronauts who they worked on it on Columbia and other places, but also my picture there, you know, so that's a legacy kind of you leave. Next slide. So in closing uh, re remarks, uh, uh, next slide. Uh, you know, you, uh, we cannot change the direction of the wind, but we can change the direction of the sails to reach our destination. Next slide. So, I'm sort of an ordinary person in an extraordinary space from Gateway of India, a gateway to universe, the VAB there. Next slide. So the first movie I saw when I came to Chicago was I Dream of Genie. And this genie came out of the bottle and you wish whatever you want for the genie and then, you know, the dream will come true. And, but it's not that, it's what it is, is the luck favors prepared mind. So you have to be prepared. Next slide. So, uh, just a small quote from me. Uh, although fate had denied my own flying dreams, I was destined to fulfill the joys of flights for many building helicopters, building planes and rockets, uh, uh, and then sending astronauts to space. Next slide. 
we'll run through some of these slides. Uh, you know, as soon as I say next slide, you continue. Uh, these are some of the traits if you want to be a uh, explorer, and we are called astronaut makers, rocket riders. Next slide. A lot of traits: uh, creativity, passion, uh, audacity, tenacity. Next slide. Solving problems. This is a very important chart. Uh, you can copy it. You know, this is how you become the best in the world um, by building upon others' knowledge, but also uh, uh, learning from others' mistakes and stuff like that. So this is a beautiful, beautiful chart. If you want an article, I can share that with you. Next slide. So if you want to become an astronaut or an astronaut maker, many, many important things. The most important thing, uh, after talking to maybe hundreds of astronauts, I know that what they tell told me, uh, including Pamela Melroy, who's my, my mentor, she said self-esteem is the most important thing. You know, have no fear and take all the risks. Unfortunately, I didn't do all that. <laughs> so I never became an astronaut. So that's okay. I became second best. So that's good enough. Next slide. So how can sky be the limit? This is a quote from my boss, uh, uh, who was the project manager, as well as the astronaut. How can sky be the limit when there are footprints on the moon? Next slide. We can achieve what we think, reach our own uh, goals and stars. Next slide. Self-esteem is the most important thing. Next slide. This is the picture of me, uh, which was taken by Michael Solori, which made it to the museum. Next slide. A tiny trigger, which made me, uh, made it possible. You may have your own trigger uh, and you have to put in all your effort. And if you fail, don't, don't call Houston, okay? <laughs> don't say Houston, we have a problem, it's your problem. So next slide. This is, uh, you have to fly with eagles and uh, there are two eagles right in the picture. I'm in the center. I'm not an eagle, but uh, on the left is my dad. Um, on the right, you know, everybody knows uh, who is that, Dr. Kalam. So next slide. Whatever you do, uh, keep going. As I said, uh, Winston Churchill one time said, if you're going through hell, keep on going. Next slide. And in the end, leave a legacy. So this is the secret, which I was going to tell you earlier. I told you that. On the left uh, is me, and then on the right of the picture is Bill MacArthur. He's one of the finest astronauts, uh, chief of astronaut office, as well as a chief of uh, ISS program, shuttle program, and he was my big boss. Uh, one of the finest astronauts uh, in, in the business. All, all, after Pamela Melroy, <laughs> I, had to, I had to protect my mentor. So uh, next slide. Well, Sometimes, you know, your dreams take a long time. Uh, mine took maybe 25 years. Next slide. Um, so I, my dream started in 64. I became an NASA engineer in 89. So next slide. So I, I don't know what to give you as a gift, but let's run the video. So with that, we'll finish the program. So I want to give you a kick in the back. Push, push towards excellence. That's my, my aim today. And I just want you to enjoy the video. It's all self-explanatory.
So go discover your wings. Know what it means to fly. Next slide. <laughs> and we are ready for question answer. Uh, Dr. Joshi, sorry for the delay. A little bit <laughs> behind schedule. Oh, no. Oh, sir. <laughs> wow, sir. That uh, What a great session today it was. Uh, you have given a complete overview of the space program and the human space exploration. I hope that this session will really help the students, uh, particularly the students who are aspiring to join the space programs in the future or to become the space engineer will really give them uh, to achieve uh, their dreams. Uh, this session is going to give them the real glimpse of how the space program is uh, coming up and the human space exploration. It, you have given a complete overview of this the space uh, programs. So, and that's what we seem to the next boom also, sir. Thanks for such a wonderful session. Uh, we have almost uh, 288 questions in the lineup now. <laughs> oh my God. <laughs> <laughs> so, and uh, the best part of the question is, uh, uh, it's, I'll start from here, that uh, how can I be such a successful person like you? <laughs> uh, very, very good question. So, uh, I don't know what to, what to say. That's, uh, that's, uh, the kind of question who never, uh, which was never asked to me. <laughs> uh, I think uh, success is uh, and failure are two sides of a coin, um, and basically there is no such thing as total success or total failure. It's all learning and experience. In the end, you know, uh, you know, uh, you're not judged by how much money you have uh, uh, or how much what car you draw or how big a house you have. You are judged by what you have done to the world. I think that's success for me. So just because I launched 100 rockets and launched everything else, that doesn't mean success. The success comes from leaving a legacy that, that tomorrow if I go away, I want to be known that I, I was a NASA engineer. I did something extraordinary, but also I gave back to the world. It's called you know, paying it forward in America. So what have I given to the world back, you know? And I think that is the uh, most beautiful success. For me, uh, I don't accept money. I don't charge anybody for mentoring, but what I'm giving back to the world and community uh, is what I share and I'll take back with me. You know? And uh, that is what success is about. So if, if you become the best in whatever you do and uh, change the world for a better world and then give back to the world, you know, uh, because you're not gonna take the money with you. you know? Fine, sir. Uh, the second question is uh, from the students, and mostly I'll say that the question now is just getting up. Uh, the numbers are increasing like anything. It's three or <laughs> two now, <laughs> and but most of the questions are of the um, almost of the same time. That uh, most of the plus twelve students are the students who are in their. Um, uh, engineering side or doing the physics uh, in BSc or MSc plus mostly the plus two students, they want to know that um, what steps should I take to become an astronaut? Well, um, definitely uh, you have to be in America and become an American citizen unless you want to be an Indian astronaut, which is also possible. Now, I was lucky to work in manned space flight in America. And uh, it's pretty tough to get into uh, uh, being an astronaut in America. So it is possible that one can look at uh, ISRO as a possibility because I've gone to ISRO many times. I know all the administrators since uh, Dr. Kasturi Rangan way back in the 80s. And uh, ISRO is trying, thinking of going, uh, you know, sending man, men to space and maybe there's opportunity for them. Uh, to become an astronaut, obviously, you have to have a passion in one of the science subjects. Um, like Kalpana had the CFD, computational fluid dynamics. Uh, in my case, I was more a uh, finite element structural dynamics. So you have to, uh, it has to be related. Like uh, 
our dean has, uh, uh, you know, is expert in robotics and other things. So you have to be expert in something which uh, NASA needs or ISRO needs and stuff like that. So now ISRO wants to go to Mars or moon, they may need somebody who is interested in, you know, uh, building habitats there. So some, some special area, then you have to know how to fly. Uh, also scuba diving, survival training. Uh, you also, like uh, Chris Hadfield said, why should I take you to space? You know, are you the best team player? Are you going to save me in case I get into trouble? Uh, there is psychological examination or many, many examinations. So basically those are the three or four major areas which, which you have to prove that, you know, you can do all those things, you know. And that's what I look for in people. Uh, but in the, in the end, I think it's all about being a, a, a team player, you know, uh, because without team players, you know, we don't want you in part of the space program. That's uh, really great, sir. Uh, then the few of the, many of the students has uh, asked uh, to know about your career path, sir, that uh, how from India you moved to US and joined the um, Boeing and then from Boeing to NASA and then astronaut maker. So what's, uh, how you achieve that goal? Uh, I think uh, sometimes uh, th there is what they call as luck or serendipity. You know, I, I'd never planned to become a uh, work for NASA or even didn't think about it because uh, I was not a good student in India, but, but I had a dream about flying. But unfortunately, you know, my mother said, that if you fly, you die. My father said, no money. And they were not willing to um, help me with flying. But, you know, just the movie Sangam doesn't mean anything because I used to fly all the time. When I was one year, one month old baby, I used to fly because I, my mother used to, my parents lived in Burma. So I was always flying in planes. So, so I had passion about flying. Uh, but uh, then in 75, when I graduated from uh, Bangalore, uh, I had a chance to, my parents were living in the Middle East and I got a chance to go to Germany. In fact, my, I wanted to work for Mercedes-Benz company because I was looking at engineering excellence. And uh, for me, systems engineering, engineering excellence was a big thing. But uh, Germans didn't want to take my Indian degree. So I ended up in Chicago as a tourist, actually. I didn't have money. I, I just didn't have admission into the college. But still, I persevered uh, and uh, had uh, some luck with uh, IIT Chicago. And uh, that's how I ended up in IIT. And one of the jobs, uh, well, research money we were granted was in railroads. And I, so sometimes, you know, you have to work in uh, areas which is not amenable to your dreams. It's not the right path, but you have to take the risk and say, hey, I will change my path later, maybe, you know, or deviate from my path later, but let me establish myself. So I had to get my green card, get an education, get a green card, get a job, and then make sure that I can, uh, work for companies like Boeing and uh, Boeing at that time because that was an aerospace company. So I knew that uh, by joining Boeing, my path would lead me to NASA someday because Boeing was already doing uh, uh, rocket engines and other things and already working in helicopters and planes. And uh, Boeing 747, as you've seen, the plane which carries, it's called the shuttle aircraft carrier, um, you know, that was already designed by Boeing. Um, so basically, I knew that there was a path. So and a lot of times it is a gut feel. So uh, you go with the gut feel or uh, go with your heart, you know, uh, listen to your heart and say that I'm going to follow this path. And many times I was shot down because even in Boeing, I had a red line on my badge and they wouldn't even let me in, inside the library in Boeing, you know, because I was not a citizen. So then I became a citizen with the help of my boss. Then I came to NASA in 1988, 89. And then at that time, they said, we can get you a job because you only worked in railroads, mining and helicopters. You don't have a space background. And so many, many hurdles you pass through, but you keep the dream going, you know. And uh, in the end, uh, uh, why vibroacoustics? I was lucky because I did some work in Boeing on vibration testing and other things. So my background was in test engineering. So if you do and do become a test engineer and a systems engineer, I can guarantee you, you can follow my path, you know. That's, uh, that's really great. Uh, 
normally there's a question uh, which just came into my mind that uh, mostly when we see the organization like NASA or SpaceX or ISRO, there's something came into each and every one, uh, one's mind that or it's if it's a Boeing, that either the aircraft or the space shuttle uh, or um, uh, kind of launch vehicle. So what are the other, this is for the students uh, who have joined for this session, plus two students, I'll say that intermediate student, that they want to know that what are the different options available in these organizations, apart from uh, a um, launch vehicle or aircraft or a space technology, what are the different other options like human factor or, uh, some kinds of psychological uh, engineer, psychologist. So what are the different options available in these organizations? Well, we, wants... you know, yeah, uh, a very good question because I, as I showed you in one of the charts earlier, you know, you don't have to be necessarily become a, a astronaut or astronaut maker. You can work in materials technology or become a physicist or astronomer. Uh, or you can become a planetary uh, physicist or a uh, communication engineer, electrical engineer, mechanical engineer, systems engineer, um, uh, or you can work in safety. Uh, so there are many, many aspects. See, uh, the way uh, we were lucky, or I was lucky to be working on the launch pad and worked in all these areas because I just had, uh, um, uh, I just pushed myself to the limit. Uh, but, but if you just wanted to do some uh, design work or research work, you could be doing research work on satellites or, uh, or asteroids and things like that. So there is no limit to it. You can be a geologist, you can be a robotics engineer, or you can be just an ordinary uh, uh, design engineer you know, uh, for designing the rocket or the pad or the maintenance guy or maintenance systems. You know? So you don't have to really uh, be part of the rockets. It can be any engineering aspect, like you can be doing testing and testing involves uh, all the systems. So it doesn't have to be a rocket or a, a uh, plane, you know, it can be anything else, you know. So there are a lot of, lot of general jobs right now, like, uh, you know, uh, I'm looking at op opportunities where you can be a project manager and a project engineer, you know, or a project person. You don't have, or you can be, a scheduling person. So really, you don't have to be an engineer, you know. Sir, uh, also I, yeah. I request you to answer because uh, we just don't have science students, uh, uh, you know, as a pan, you know, uh, attendees. We have students from commerce and humanities background also. So they're mm -hmm. also seeking, you know, uh, information from you, how they can be a part of organizations like Boeing, NASA, ISRO. So yeah. do they have well, options? To work with yeah, yeah basically that's what i mentioned a little bit uh, uh, with with materials on one side uh, as aerospace engineers uh yeah thanks for letting me know that because i thought a lot of people are aerospace engineers but you know uh, like in the kennedy space center we we have human resources people working you know we have accounting people working we have planning people working scheduling people working you know transportation people for transporting things uh, coordination things like that so it, it doesn't matter. Like I had 20,000 employees in Kennedy Space Center. Only about 500 engineers were there. The rest were all doing many, many different types of jobs. Some were uh, 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 not engineers at all. I would say many of the people, uh, find, less than 500 people were real engineers. The rest of them were just technicians. Uh, uh, they, they were not even engineers or nothing to do with engineering. You know? uh, like accounting, uh, you know, planning, lawyers, attorneys, you know things like that, you know. So you name a uh, field and NASA had that kind of employee because in, in the in the world, I have 1 million employees, you know. So some were coordinating, just putting things together, you know, basically, you know. So not necessarily all are engineers, you know, and they have all kinds of opportunities, you know. Like many of my friends who work for Boeing or Lockheed, they're in human resources, actually, you know. Yeah. And that's what actually we see in the organization. When we talk about the organization, there is a multidisciplinary uh, kind of people, some in the human uh, production side, somewhere in the planning side, somewhere in the accounts. So mix of people required in an organization. Thank you, sir, for giving the slide. Uh, another such uh, question is, where do you see the whole world of space community in the coming year? 
and how many times more it will take to make the space travel for common people a reality? Um, space, uh, you know, uh, I, I have a quote, uh, you know, I need to re refresh my mind here. Uh, space is the ultimate destination to orchestrate uh, the create, uh, creations of your uh, heart and uh, chisel the dreams within your mind. That's my quote. Uh, and I think I feel that, you know, mankind has explored the earth completely. And now we have a lot of possibilities in space. Obviously, earth is also in space. Now, uh, I think my, my feeling is that there is, if you look at the history of development of technology in, in the world, you know, since 1958, when we started uh, Sputnik and other things in 57, the technological innovations have taken off. And those uh, innovations are, I won't say all are done by NASA, I won't say all are done by space, but there are requirements which uh, 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 NASA has had to go to space and that requirements drove innovation on, on Earth basically. And so uh, uh, my thinking is that, you know, these innovations are producing tremendous, tremendous opportunities for youngsters in India and all over. So you were asking me earlier, you don't have to join NASA or you don't have to join Boeing. You can create your own Boeing, you know. You may not be able to create your own NASA, but you can create a small, a small subset of Boeing, you know, or Honeywell or something like that. So I want you to be entrepreneurs. Like this, the guy, just like that guy who saw the opportunity where he was using his uh, uh, suitcase and suddenly he said, okay, you are putting the suitcase on a wheel. So why don't I put the wheels on the suitcase, you know? So he was thinking, you know why he did that? Because he had introspection as well as he was uh, opening his eyes and uh, ears and he looked for opportunity. So when innovation comes when you see uh, something uh, is missing in the current state of the art, you know? So suppose you have a car, with three wheels, you know, you'll put four wheels, you know, or five wheels, or you may, you may put two wheels to make it a scooter. So, you know, in, uh, I just want to give you a simple example, like going back 500 years in London, England, there are 500 different types of hammers were sold in, in the same city in London. Why would you, when anybody need to find a different types of hammers? Because the hammer designed by uh, Dr. Joshi, I didn't like it. I said, okay, it doesn't have a, a small handle. It just has a small handle. Uh, but I have to kill a big animal and I don't want to go near the animal. So I put a bigger handle. So that's the innovation because it is a limitation of the current state of the art. And uh, space travel is like that because now people want to travel. Mankind has done two things best, communicating uh, himself, uh, communications and transportation. So we moved from Africa and came all over the world we transported ourselves, but we also communicated. We had smoke signals. We had, uh, you know, uh, bands, you know, uh, and, uh, and stuff like that. Many, many fires, you know, many different types of small, uh, signals around the world in the old days for communication. Now, NASA is working on laser comm from space. So basically, what I'm trying to impress upon you is, yeah, space travel is going to come maybe within next 20 years or within 20 years, uh, somebody will be going to space. Uh, maybe only a few hundred kilometers, but he'll be going to space. Yeah. Okay. Uh, sir, my next question is to Dean School of Engineering, uh, Professor Vick, uh, because there are many such questions which came from uh, to UPS. Uh, sir, what are the different options available in UPS for the engineering aspirants? And uh, can we do a multidisciplinary courses? How UPS going to help us in creating a future future which will create an impact in the real world okay oh, very good question i guess uh, you know education is very important as i said you know uh, education is a stepping stone for uh, uh, for engineers and scientists and non scientists also uh, because that gives them the basic ideas and basic uh, tools necessary so Using those tools, we have to integrate the, the uh, industry. So what I would do if I was UP, UPS is basically uh, have the coursework, multidisciplinary coursework, uh, which doesn't mean that you should only have engineers, you can have all disciplines, but then bring industry one at a time and try to uh, integrate industry and then 
give internships to these people. So uh, why America is doing, uh, you know, do, doing very well is because the industry looks for these interns, you know, even before you graduate the second year of the college, uh, I, I did a five year of engineering. So even in my second year, I would get an internship. Well, not in India, but obviously I didn't do it. But in America, I would say that, that you do an internship uh, and the industry will absorb these local students and teach them a particular area. And then after five years, then the you know, university student will become part of the, uh, uh, you know, part of the industry, basically. Mm -hmm. So only when you bring industry together with their curricula, uh, education curriculum and hands-on experience. So these people have to come back and teach the same thing to other people. Only maybe few interns can go from your class of hundreds, say, you know, uh, maybe five people go. But these people have to come back and teach the others. So this way, there is a good balance between the industry and the and the uh, school university there. You know. Okay, uh, Pro Professor, wait, uh, would you like to add it up? Uh... Yeah, I, I think uh, it's been a great great talk. And yes, uh, I think uh, India is definitely um, uh, moving up the um, um, the technology ladder, shall we say? Uh, so clearly, um, we have a long way to catch up to the United States, uh, the way we've heard uh, Ravi talk about uh, what NASA has been doing since the uh, 60s and uh, even earlier. Um, uh, and, and it's been a truly inspirational uh, talk. But ISRO is now, of course, uh, doing, of course, many things as well. India has got uh, made huge uh, advances uh with the rocket capabilities and so on and uh, independence and 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 and, and uh, by all accounts india is um, has got uh, great uh, ambitions in this sector so we we also had a very uh, interesting talk uh, from the uh, director of uh, isro a few weeks ago so also a very similar history to yourself sir so so very very nice uh, to to know that there is this kind no of it's uh, important that uh, you mentioned that that uh, you know isro is doing many many good things unfortunately with a lack of budget or uh, small budget they are doing yeah. great things you know as i said the small beginnings come big great things absolutely, and, uh, absolutely. Uh, i met a lot of good isro people my mm -hmm. own cousin works for isro in bangalore mm -hmm. and uh, I've had a lot of connections with ISRO from 1990s mm -hmm. uh, with Kasuri Rangan and Madhwan Nair and everybody has mm -hmm. come to NASA. Right, but the uh, right, most right. important thing I would want to impress upon the students is that, you know, we, 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 I don't want them to uh, stop somewhere at the bottom of the pyramid. I want them to go to the top of the pyramid where Absolutely. they're uh, using maximum potential, you know. Uh, I, I want them to think that, you know, uh, you know, to, to tell you the truth, I, I'm, I, I'm an American today. I work for NASA 30 years, but my heart is still Indian. You know, it will never change. It will <laughs> never change. You know? <laughs> so uh, the reason I'm doing all this for India and establishing NSS office in Mumbai is because I want to give back to the country, you know, just like, you know, uh, Swadesh basically, you know, and uh, not because of the movie, because uh, I, I, I just feel that I should give back. And I'm an ambassador for the world, really, but India is special for me, obviously. And I see that there is, a, you know, Indians have greatest potential, but they're not fully using the potential uh, to be the best in the world, you know. And I think I want them to, uh, I want to push them to excellence. And that's the reason yeah. uh, for some uh, lectures like this and others. No, no, we really look forward to working with you and um, you, you, uh, and, and, you know, uh, helping, uh, young aspirants in India and then Asia and everywhere, I guess, because the youth... Yeah, I want to tell you, uh, I want to impress upon you that, uh, you know, me and Kalpana Chawla were not smart or intelligent people, I guess, you know, compared to many, many Indians I know, you know. <laughs> so some of the students who are coming to America and some parts of the world in India, they are brilliant, brilliant kids, okay? So hats off to them. And uh, I know many of them. I, I think... Uh, we just met uh, Aishwarya from your school yesterday and she's going to uh, Georgia Tech. I know another girl from uh, Hyderabad, Zafira. Mm -hmm. You know, um, I met her in NSS Mumbai. So there are many, many kids, but oh. I want them to go through excellence, you know, and uh, use their fullest potential, you know. So uh, they're, they're much smarter than us, definitely. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Smart is an is a interesting thing. So smart in many, many ways. So smartness is a multifaceted <laughs> thing. 
So I, I think uh, there's a role for everybody. I think is the is what you've heard, what I've heard you say, and and it's it's, it's great that you uh, have uh, stated your failure and using that failure, you have done incredible things. So this is a inspiration, I think, for all of us. So um, I, I really, really thank you for uh, a fantastic talk. It was really, really great. Uh, so I don't know. Uh, uh, Professor Joshi, I think uh, because it's so late, I, I yeah, think yeah. children, children <laughs> are asking, uh, kind of saying, how long will it go on for, sir? So, so we, <laughs> we, we, we must close it, but I think it can go yes. on for much more. Right? I can go on for the next couple of hours. No, problem. <laughs> no I, I, I really invite you to come to Dehradun um, later on in the year. And yeah, definitely. Uh, I, I, I hope we can have some um, real projects uh, with NASA and with Rizro and and, and start making ro rockets on campus and things like that, real engineering projects as well as uh, other things, uh, because this is what really makes everything uh, tick. So we, we have plans to have, um, uh, and I was really fascinated to hear your story earlier about the, uh, the helicopter on Mars, which is absolutely fantastic, you know, absolutely fantastic. So, so really, really, uh, I want to have uh, these kind of projects uh, being done by our students. So, Professor Joshi, thank you. Thank my you, permission to start this. Thank you. Thank you, sir. Thank you. Sure, sir. Sure. So, thank you, sir. Thank you, uh, Dr. Ravi and uh, uh, Professor Vick. Uh, a special thanks to Webhoff and Siddharth uh, from the marketing and outreach team for your great support uh, during this entire program. And, uh, sir, uh, so Dr. Ravi, uh, sir, and will be continuously in touch. And uh, as discussed, uh, we'll be needing your support for NSS Uttarakhand chapter also in the near future. Thank, Thank you, you so much, sir. Definitely. Thank, Thank, you. You. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you so much. Thank you, Thank you so much. Thank you so much. It was a delight. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. All the best. Okay. Have a nice day. Yeah. Thank you. Have a good one. Bye. Okay. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye.